we truly got to understand that in this world, everyone needs support, even the single parent. And that's why two people create a child. It's a, a teamwork. It's a it's a, a interaction between two people. And we want to discuss, we want to take some time with some experts, some of my colleagues to discuss what co-parenting, team parenting, some people call it, what co-parenting really is and how it really works. So um, as we wrap up the, the poll, I am so happy that uh, the majority of the on here today are feeling very confident and being able to get, uh, being able to have school meet their child's learning needs. Hopefully you're also confident with having schools meet your learning needs as you continue your uh, education. That's one of the great things about Montgomery College that we can all, as our children learn, we can grow and help our children move into that, that, uh, that higher education process as well, because we all need as much education as possible. So thank you for that poll. And now I get to bring to the, the webinar three incredible people. Uh, first will be Mr. Michael Yell. I'm gonna ask him to come on. And then uh, Dr. Bruce Edwards, I'm gonna ask him to pop in with us and Miss Veronica Cruz. And today we're gonna get into a discussion about co-parenting and how we wanna start this guys. And gentlemen, I hope you can bear with me. Um, I wanna ask each one of you to give three to five minutes of your background, who you are, your the, the accolades about all of what you're doing, but then just talk quickly your understanding of the co-parenting relationship. So I'm gonna start off by letting uh, Miss Veronica Cruz, gentlemen, if that's okay, I'm gonna ask Miss Veronica Cruz to introduce herself and share a little bit of her background and what co-parenting points, focus is in her work. So Miss Cruz, I'll come to you. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm glad to be here with you. My name is Veronica Cruz. I am a clinical and forensic social worker. I have over 20 years of experience directly working with uh, the child welfare system. I've worked with um, extensively with child welfare workers, foster parents, biological parents, step parents, co-parents, and clinicians throughout our state. And I've done it on the um, national level and international level. I've been very fortunate to be able to be in different settings and rooms and environments with individuals while they've been really trying to manage how to co-parent, how to be effective with their relationship and their communication with their significant others, even if they're no longer in relationships with them. Uh, my personal journey is my mother is a single parent. Uh, so I personally have witnessed and have, have benefited tremendously, immensely from the sacrifices that she made in order to provide my sister, my brother and I with the resources that she did. It wasn't easy. I constantly remind people of this. We, we lose the site when we think about how parents, especially when they're single, have to work and they have to really spread themselves thin time-wise in terms of having to work, navigating, taking care of their children, appointments. Uh, my mom did all of that simultaneously while trying to learn English. And so she was navigating unforeign systems um, and she really just showed up. So what I want to say to you all is um, thank you for showing up and putting your children first. By the mere fact that you guys are here and are taking the time and really just taking in the information. We're here for you all. We're here to provide you with as much resources, comments, questions. You, we're here We're here for it. That's what we're here for. So I want to say thank you. The, the, the mere fact that you guys are here and putting your children first, again, I think that it really shows your commitment to your children, the patience, the commitment, the time that you put into your relationship with, with your children will really change the trajectory of their lives. It will set them down a different path. And so I'm humbled and honored to be here with you all. And I'm excited to share with you all. Um, we have a lot of different things that are going to be coming up with our panel that we're going to be discussing. And so I look forward to that. I have uh, some clinical tips some non-clinical tips that I've seen with clients, with patients um, throughout my practice. And so thank you for allowing me to share this space with you all and with this great panel and with everyone here. Awesome, awesome. So we have Dr. Uh, Dr. Cruz. Now I want to jump over to uh, Brother Michael Yell uh, from singledadsonline.org uh, and let him share a little bit about the work he's doing and how co-parenting uh, relationships and education is working with what he does. So Michael, I'll throw it over to you, buddy. Thank you, sir. I appreciate it. Um, thank you for letting me join the panel. It's always an honor to be part of this, this uh, program every year. Um, my work starts, I uh, started at the age of 10 when my parents divorced. 
And that was in the 1970s. So social media didn't exist. Uh, rotary dial phones were still in existence. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I, I was a kid. I wasn't. I wasn't an adult then. But yes, rotary dial phones, um, and and the idea of divorce uh, for most people were limited to the rich and famous. I remember when my my parents announced getting divorced, and then shortly thereafter, Sonny and Cher announced that they were going to get divorced, and I couldn't believe it. It was like you know. So it started with that, and my dad didn't know how to co-parent. My mom was learning how to co-parent, and the, my brothers and I were stuck in the middle. And, and I remember going through the grieving process, which also helps with that communication and co-parenting, um, the, the anger, the negativity, the animosity, and much like the, our, our, our guest speaker had said, my, my father bat battled alcoholism his entire life and it eventually what killed him. But as a young child growing up, it was very hard. My teenage years were very dark, um, almost failed out of high school. And then um, I became a single dad myself at the age of 22. Uh, my girlfriend got pregnant or we got pregnant, was not ready to be married, didn't think the marriage was gonna work. So I made the conscious decision to be a single dad. So as I was going through being a single dad, now that's almost 30 years since my parents divorced. Now that's not quite right. About 12 years, 15 years after my parents divorced. And then as I started getting older, a lot of the, the struggles my father went through, I was going through. I'm like, how can that possibly be? How can this not evolve um, for single dads? The court systems are not always uh, impartial when it comes to the co parenting thing. And a lot of times the dads can be portrayed as the bad guy regardless of the situation, the, why the parents aren't together. Um, I remember when I had to go through the court system uh, myself to pay child support in Illinois, you have to do that. And, um, and for some reason, my son's mom was under the impression that she would get a check by the 15th of every month. I tried to explain to her it doesn't work that way. So fast forward, she tried to get me off the court system so I could pay her directly. And I made her the deal saying, well, if we do this, that's fine. And if you have to take me back to court because I don't want to pay, then I'll pay your legal bills. That, that's how confident I was. I wasn't going to be this problem. Well, the judge said to my face, he's like, as soon as I take you off the rolls, you're going to stop paying and disappear out of your child's life. And I was, I mean, I couldn't believe it. Even my son's mother said he has been active in his life. He is not going to leave him. The judge refused to do it. So those are type of the obstacles that single dads tend to go through. So when I started Single Dads Online, I'm like, you know, we need a resource for proactive parenting. And there's a ton of stuff out there. But for some reason, you know, dads, it takes a little longer for us to get it. Uh, moms seem to get the, the nurturing part really well. And because most dads are not uh, custodial dads or residential, their kids are not living with them full time. Uh, a lot of times uh, dads struggle with trying to be that Disneyland dad and want to make it a great time. And it's not a lot of proactive parenting. So I started Single Dads Online in about 2007. My son was probably 15 or 16 at the time. And I just said, I, we've got to get some information out there. We've got to empower these dads to understand that they can co-parent. They can be proactive in their kids' lives. Something as simple as making sure your children, you get a copy of your children, child's report card, you get notification about parent teacher conferences, you get, uh, you know, that if you are taking them for the weekend, that it's okay that they do chores, it's okay that you have to discipline them, it's okay to have conversations about what your kids are thinking or feeling about mom and dad not being together. So that's how single dads kind of came in, in into that realm. And I have to say over the, the number of years, I would like to think I'm making a difference and it's usually one dad at a time. Wow, Mike, um, that that powerful. I can't wait uh, to unpack some of this as we talk, uh, but I do wanna get our third panelist, uh, brother Bruce Edwards Esquire, uh, because guys, if you notice, we wanna have a, a, a very, uh, well-rounded panel. So I want to go to Bruce and let's let him share co-parenting and his background and how he's come to serve families. So brother Bruce, it's over to you. 
Uh, thank you so much. Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, my name is Bruce Edwards. Uh, my journey has been uh, quite eventful uh, to get here. Um, I, I was also born, I'm a product of uh, teen parents. Uh, my parents did the best that they could. Uh, growing up in South Florida, you also be exposed to a lot. And uh, as a product of teen parents, you often grow up with your aunts and uncles. And so you become rather uh, functional with the dysfunction. And so uh, navigating my way uh, through law school and eventually I'm currently serve as an assistant attorney general with the state of Maryland. I represent the local department of social services over in Caroline County. And through that, you see everything from child protective services, adult protective services, but I spend a majority of my time uh, dealing with uh, our foster youth. Um, and in that capacity over the last 16 years that I've been practicing, um, I represented both parents, now the, the current local department of social services, and I've represented over 1,500 foster youth throughout the state of Maryland. And I practiced in uh, 17 out of 24 jurisdictions throughout the state. And so you see everything in regards to any, any and all things that can impact a child negatively in terms of dealing with failures and co-parenting as well as uh, abuse and neglect. Um, and so you try to prevent and also have preventative measures and proactive techniques to help these children process those traumas any and all things that they've been exposed to. And then on the back end, what I do um, as an adjunct professor with Anne Arundel Community College, I teach in a local prison over in Jessup. Um, and I teach at Dorsey Run Correctional Facility. And there you see uh, some of my students who are getting ready to transition out, primarily men, um, they're trying to parent. Um, then they have that distance in which they've been away from their uh, loved ones. Um, and whether or not they can try to vibe, and whether or not uh, basically be able to answer the question, am I still fit to be a parent? Um, what do I do in terms of the time, the time allotment, the guilt, the pain, um, you know, just this issue of, of time, how do I account for that? Um, how do I get reacclimated with my child's life? And so I've seen so many different facets. Um, that's, those are also the things that I introduced in my book, The 14 Virtues of the Good Father. Um, and so I'm trying to do everything that we need to do to be a better community. And we do that so much by strengthening our parents, strengthening our families. We can also save our communities. Again, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm really looking forward to participating in this panel. Oh, wow. Okay, guys, we, we are, we, we're strapped in and uh, make sure as you listen in today, if you got questions, drop them in our Q and A because we want to we want to open the door to this this conversation. And I, I want to open the door by definition so that we're all talking from the same page. Although each one of us have a different perspective to where we come to uh, to this page. And the word I want to or the the phrase I want to define from each one of your point of view is the word co-parenting. What is co-parenting? What does it mean? And uh, I saw some smiles popping in faces immediately. So uh, Veronica, we're going to go to you. Define this in your work and, and what you see, what co-parenting is, so we can all get on the same page. So uh, I think it, I, I was smiling because it's, it's such a loaded, complex, it, it sounds very simplistic, like what is co-parenting? And then you really just have to break it down. The best analogy I can tell you, it's like a, it's an onion. It's very layered. Every time you remove one layer, another one comes out and there's so many. But I think ultimately when I clinically and personally think of co-parenting, it is really putting your personal desires, your dreams, your resentments, your animosity, your frustrations, anything, that, any emotions, you're essentially any negative or emotions that can impact your ability to be present for your children when you're no longer with your significant, your ex-significant other putting them aside and really putting at the forefront the emotions and how it will affect your child. So it's really putting aside any, any feelings that you have that can negatively impact the relationship, putting your children first. And I think for me, the two main things that I think about is, and Wes really articulated that when he was doing his keynote, it's a lot of compromise. You have to really compromise and you have to have a very strong partnership and it requires patience because it's gonna be difficult. It's coming together when you don't necessarily see the eye on a lot of topics, but what the decisions you make can really impact, again, the trajectory of, the, of your children's lives. Okay, okay, all right. Um, and, and I'm gonna throw it to Michael real quick, but Mike, I do wanna give you uh, one of the, uh, 
you know, accolades that someone dropped. This is singledads.org is very helpful information so far. It is relevant to single and married parents. So congratulations on the work you're doing. You are making the impact you wanted. So come on, come on, dad. Give us the, the, the definition of what this thing co-parenting is, Mike. Well, co-parenting is one of those things to where you are working together to raise your child or your or your children. Oops, I thought I put this on you. I apologize. Um, uh, being able to work together. And as uh, Veronica said and Bruce has, has also said, it's a journey and you have to work through your demons um, to work together for the sake of your children. Because it's not about you, it's about your child. And the one thing that helps with co-parenting is consistent parenting on uh, your end as an individual. You can't control what others are going to do. You can only control what you're going to do. And one of those key things to co-parenting is making sure that you put the animosity at the door. Um, you make sure that you're not using your children as bulletin boards. What I mean by that is that you're not saying, tell your mom this, tell your dad this. Uh, don't forget, tell your dad, don't forget to write the child support check. All of that stuff has to stay within the realm of the adults. And unfortunately, some of the biggest issues that I've run into with co-parenting personally, and one of the reasons why single dads is out there is because if there was a mistake to be made as a co-parent, I, I did it. I, I guarantee you I did it. And knowing going forward um, what you know, I needed to do to be a better parent to my son. Mm -hmm. And once, as, as Veronica said, once you can kind of get past that, that negativity, the court thing, the court system, all of that stuff, you can try, you got to commit to each other that you're going to co-parent and you can agree to disagree and your parenting styles may be different, but at the end of the day, if your children have a roof over their head, there's food in their stomach, um, uh, they're being educated um, and you're willing to listen and not pass blame, your co-parenting will eventually succeed. And I think all of us can agree it, it is not an overnight process and very few parents get the co-parenting thing instantly. It's, it's, it's very hard to do it, especially if you're in the process of a divorce um, or a process of being a new parent and you're going through the court system because it's adversarial by definition. You know, mm -hmm. your attorney's looking out for you, their attorney's looking out for her. This is what we're all entitled to. And we're listening to the court systems instead of kind of listening to our heart and what's in the best interest of our children because our children are not property. They're not the glasses and the couch and the bed. They're part of who we are. And the other piece that had worked for me as, as co-parenting is, you know, when you have those difficult decisions with uh, their mom, or in, if, if you're a mom online here now, the dad, is you've got to have these conversations out of earshot of your children. Children are not foolish. They're not, I don't care how young they are. They hear, they watch, they observe. So because you go into your bedroom and close your door and start having an argument, doesn't mean they can't hear you or they're standing outside your door. I learned very quickly, thank God cordless phones came out in the 80s and 90s, that you could walk outside or you could go into your car and close the door or go somewhere where your children could not hear. And that was a really hard lesson to learn because it came back to bite me in the rear end one time when my son threw it back in my face. And, and I, I didn't know how to handle it. I mean, it's like, how, okay, he, he caught me. So the co-parenting thing is a journey. It is not overnight. There's anger, frustration, tears. And I will say dads, the whole child support thing, um, it's an obligation you, you make to your children if you have to pay it. And you can't use that as a bargaining tool, period. You know, I paid child support, I'm entitled. Or, or you know, you, or even moms can't use that as, a, as a, your children as bargaining chips to get what you want or need. My, my son's mom and I did a lot of give and take. So if it was my weekend, but there was a family birthday on her side, that needed to, you know, hey, you know, it's my sister's birthday, there's a big party. I didn't make a stink and saying, hey, it's my weekend, tough. You know, I said, okay, fine, we'll work on it next weekend. And the other part of co-parenting is making sure you're communicating with your children on a, on a regular and daily basis. And I'm sorry I've taken so much time, I apologize. No, 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 no. Um, and, and I hope that everybody listening, I, I know I'm taking notes here because there's, there's a, some common threads so far we've heard. Uh, you gotta deal with your emotions, put them aside compromise, uh, a process, a journey. So I'm gonna throw it over to you, Bruce. Help us define this co-parenting thing from a legal standpoint. Uh, 
And one, one uh, dealing with family law, one of the uh, the most uh, pertinent uh, legal perspectives um, that we usually try to apply is what's in the best interest of the child. Um, what's in the best interest of the child, uh, and also there's a uh, a natural presumption. It's a rebuttal a rebuttable presumption, but there's a natural presumption that the best interest of that child will be with this natural parents. Um, and so, but we also have to ensure that that's a safe environment, that's a nurturing environment. Is free from any form of toxicity. Um, you know, most importantly, when I advise some of my uh, prior clients and dealing with when I had my uh, private practice, I always just uh, just really implored them about being honest. Um, you know, a lot of folks can't heal because they refuse to be honest. Um, and I know that's a loaded term. Um, a lot of folks can't get ahead because they refuse to be honest. And you know, children like that. I mean, if you you can't if you don't have honesty, you don't have any form of trust. You don't have trust, you don't have a relationship. So one of the foundational principles that you need to have is some level of honesty. And when you're talking about co-parenting, sometimes, sometimes, as you heard um, what Michael mentioned, um, it's a process and things can evolve, but that they also evolve by your ability to be honest and also to build trust. Mm -hmm. And children see that, they witness that. Um, and so I advise a lot of clients, you know, um, a lot of men would say things like, well, you know, I want to be with my child, but I can't get along with my child's mother. I said, well, you need to make it about the child and not the child's mother. Uh, maybe have you ever thought about maybe if you sort of like embrace that child's mother, treat her with more dignity and respect, that can be a way of you winning some more time and opportunity to spend with your child. Look at it as a package deal. Again, you know, a lot of people, they make it, they have all of these uh, subplots and they lose focus as to what matters the most. And we're dealing with co-parenting. You can't let what matters the most be at the mercy of what matters the least. And um, mm. so many, so many folks are just unwilling to make the necessary sacrifices on behalf of the best interests of the child. And what's best for that child is being with both parents, being able to know both parents, spending quality time with both parents, both parents being able to love on that child. That child actually witnessing both parents getting along. Uh, treating each other with respect, with dignity, understanding that that's where they that's where they've come from. Um, so everything has to be child centered, child focused, and with that, we can do that by starting to be honest. Even if it's painful at times, you being able to talk about past hurts, past traumas. That's the only way you can heal by mm. being able to be honest about it. And again, you can't heal if you're unwilling to be honest. Okay, so we we we. We've unpacked that, and there's some questions I want to get to just real quickly, but we're going to come back and keep this conversation going. Uh, one of our participants asked about the book. Um, has everybody, has anybody read or or see uh, read the book? Things fathers should say for mothers with sons. So that might be a resource for those who know uh, or, or who are dealing with mom, single moms who may be raising boys. And the next question, and I don't know if this is, uh, 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 I, I'm just going to ask it. Why are boys more impacted in this environment? I don't know if that's a, a truism, but I do want to try to unpack that because, you know, the question is out there and I'm not, I'm not sure where we go with that. So does anybody want to jump into that question and talk about boys and how they're impacted in this process? Well, I, I would ask then, I would ask the question is, where's the relationship between the boys and the dad? Mm. Because sometimes the reason the boys be more, are more impact, especially if residency is with the mom, is the dads are not proactively involved in their life. It might just be on the weekends. It might be once a month. And there's various reasons why that happens. But a lot of times, uh, if the dad is not active in that child's life, like my father tried really hard to learn to co-parenting and, 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 and it was very sporadic. And again, because of technology, he went six months, eight months without calling us and, 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 you know, didn't have voicemail, didn't have answering machines. So I would, that be, I would ask is where is the dad's um, involvement with, with their sons? That's, that's number one. Number two is the grieving process is also a key point in working through and building co-parenting and relationships with your children and understanding. And, and we, there's still a lot of stereotypes with boys and men. We don't show emotion. We don't cry. We suck it up. We deal with it. And all of that pain festers. And unfortunately with boys, sometimes that tends to be um, more negative behavior, more solemn behavior, 
uh, more reactionary behavior. And, and, and I didn't raise daughters. I had a son, my mom raised three boys. So I'm kind of at a loss maybe because there's a better relationship with mother and daughter because the, the residency is more with the mom than the dad. So that's my perspective. All right. Anybody else? Go ahead, Ms. Veronica. Yeah. Okay. Oh, go ahead. Oh. Go ahead, Bruce. I'll keep my train of thought. Go ahead. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, I would I would echo what, what Michael has said. Um, I, I run a, a very popular mentoring program through my fraternity in uh, Prince George's County. And what I can say is that uh, many of my uh, participants, it's a male mentoring program, many of my participants come way come by way of single mothers. Um, and you will find that they're making up for that lost uh, male involvement time at home because as Michael mentioned, where's the relationship with the father? Um, you know, sometimes it's null and void. Uh, some, some, of these, some of these young men are still trying to process their overall self-identity. Um, yeah. Saying, well, hey, you know, my father's not involved. Why doesn't he want me? Um, you know, I don't understand why he doesn't come around. Um, he's making everything about him. And you really, you really can really put the stamp on it to how these children at a young age, they begin to embrace what selfishness really means. Because anytime a father, you choose to be absent out of a child's life, that's just the epitome of selfishness. And they're really learning to embrace that so I am grateful for the opportunity the way you can actually save a generation to say, hey, even though your father wasn't there, these are some things that we can implant to help you grow, to help you nurture, to help you develop, uh, to say, so you know what not to do when you stand in the shoes of becoming a father yourself. But you do see that if in fact, that the more involved that father is, you see it on the reverse end, the more involved that father is, it kind of impacts and increases the life chances of that particular male youth um, in regards to what he's able to do, he's able to go off to school, he's able to be successful, he's able to have a functional and thriving family himself. Um, so we really will have to start there in regards to how impactful um, that particular father is with that child. And lastly, I can say, having represented numerous foster youth throughout the state of Maryland, my most challenging climate, excuse me, my most challenging client has always been teen girls. Um, yep, that's what I'm saying. My, <laughs> my most challenging client has always been teen girls, many of whom have grown up fatherless, um, mm -hmm. who don't know their father. We really disconnect when as soon as we go to talking about male identity, uh, we speak about fatherhood, people automatically go to jump into, oh, that's 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 um fathers and boys. You'll be you'll be amazed that studies have shown that so many girls get their self-esteem from their relationships with their fathers. Um, it, it studies have revealed that. And so I, I would be remiss if I don't bring that up. Um, and many of these young ladies, given they're not in tune with who they are, their self-worth, their self-value, their self-esteem, they attach themselves to a, young, to a young man who don't know who he is because his father wasn't there. And now we have an overall lost level of generations here. And so it's work to be done on both ends but overall male involvement, it increases the life chances of all of our youth, I would say. Yeah. Thank you. Absolutely. So I Doc. wanted, if I, if, I could, if I could just piggyback on um, what uh, Bruce just said real quick, that's exactly the, what I was going to say. So I'm in the area of clinical and forensic social work. So I've done a, a, a close to 600 criminal cases. And so that I was going to bring in the female component because you're right. But I also want to bring in something my Michael said, you said reactionary behavior. And from a trauma lens, <clears throat> the reason why oftentimes we hear more about males is because when we see trauma responses, we see very specific gender trauma responses. Um, I teach this to my students all the time. I teach this to clinicians. What we see is boys tend to be very external with their reactionary behavior. So they tend to be external. They, they, we see a lot of anger, a lot of impulsivity. Females, as Bruce said, are more internal. So a lot of the self-doubt, we see a lot of self-esteem issues. Absolutely. If I, if I could take uh, just anecdotally from my cases, the females that have had uh, charges, I would say over 80, maybe close to 90% of them have had charges related to males, that they have taken on charges, have done something to acquire a certain set of self-esteem. So I think it's incumbent upon fathers to be there present for their daughters and their sons because we see very different responses but I think we have to think about externally how it shows up and internally how it affects it that's why oftentimes we hear a little bit more about males I just wanted to bring it I see it clinically 
on both fronts. Just it shows up differently. Well, you you guys uh, uh truly uh took that that question and 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 helped us all kind of unpack it. But Bruce, I just want to ask something. Uh you, you said something that I don't want to breeze over. And for those people raising sing of single parents raising boys, there are opportunities for boys to see positive men. And he said something about a fraternity. What fraternity is that, may I ask? Uh, I'm a member of Kappa Alpha Psi fraternity, the Bowie Mitchellville alumni chapter in Prince George's County, and I'm the chair of the Kappa League there. Um, and we do some phenomenal work uh, in terms of uh, training for leadership, uh, the maturation of manhood. We have an open house on Saturday, September 17th. Uh, we're really looking forward to just uh, bless, blessing a new generation of young men coming through age of sixth grade to 12th grade. And we also uh, produce college scholarships as well. And, and I ask you to bring that up because I, I want us to know that there are supports and that's what this is for. And, you know, even though those guys wear red and white, they're still very good gentlemen. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a brother of Omega Psi Phi Fraternity Incorporated, so uh, I appreciate it. But and I laugh and joke about that, Bruce. But the reality is, there are a a a number of strong, uh, uh, well-meaning and viable organizations and and men and families. Uh, someone had asked earlier, do you know of any free parenting programs? So if uh, on our resources that will be at the website, we'll share any that we do know. Um, and, and I'll tell you guys, uh, Dr. Cruz brought up something that, that takes us to this next question. You know, and, and we talk about these responses, these external responses there. There's some, 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 you know, anger tied into this because unfortunately, or fortunately, I don't know how you want to say it. Children are usually created out of emotion and now we're saying put emotions aside to raise them. So it, it, it is a crazy situation. So let's talk. What if you're afraid of the other parent hurting your child? And I know uh, Dr. Cruz will come to you immediately because you, you come from that forensic side where oftentimes those things come up. So would you speak to that mm -hmm. when we're talking about co-parenting? So I, I will, and I think, so I want to just step back a little bit before sure. you're even afraid that they're going to hurt. You know, I think, and I will address that one because I, I think that one is key. I think what we're really going to is what happens when, you know, ideally you want this co-parenting relationship, but the other parent isn't allowing that. So I think okay. the first thing is when we think of a fire, we wouldn't add more wood to it. So being very mindful, and it's hard when emotions are running, just really being calm, pragmatic, really setting up really strong boundaries so that they can be respected. This is what's expected. And if that's not possible, because I would love to say that co-parenting is easy. And I can tell you somehow, I don't know, other clinicians have found me. I have a lot of clinicians that I provide therapy for. And one of the things that they come for is for co-parenting. And they come because they they know as clinicians, and I also have non-clinicians, but they don't want to project those those feelings of anger and animosity onto their children, or they don't want to make passive aggressive, aggressive statements, or your father is this, or your mother is that. That starts setting certain tones, and so you don't want to do that because you start creating parental alienation, and it creates all these hybrid of different um, emotions and problems throughout the relationship. But I think when you're fearful, and this is hard because I can tell you, and I think Bruce can really speak to this as well, it's, it's easier and, I, and I'll say this from a clinical stance, it's easier to demonstrate physical harm, physical abuse. But when you're talking about emotion or psychological, the courts aren't always as receptive. And so I clinically think on a personal level, emotional and psychological abuse is the most detrimental to a child because pain, physical pain, eventually someone is able to dissociate and remove themselves. But what you say to someone, especially someone that's very close to you, your parents, your, your siblings, your significant other, those words stay and linger. They, they manifest into who the people think that they are. So if you are fearful, whether we're talking about physical, emotional, I think you just have to be very specific about how you make allegations and how you document them so that you can be heard. And I say this because oftentimes people get so caught up on putting everything on paper, just be very pragmatic about how you write it. If you're fearful that your child could be hurt, your child's well-being is at the forefront 
always, always report it, reach out, make sure that your child is safe, whether it's physical, emotional, psychological. And I'm saying that because I think we're, we more readily go to physical, sexual, but we also need to look at the psychological and emotional harm that can happen. Absolutely. And I'm going to throw it over to Michael and then I want to Bruce to kind of close that off from a, a legal standpoint. So Michael, talk to us about, you know, that, that, in, in response to that question, and especially with physical, emotional, and, and, and dealing with this in co-parenting from education on your side. So, and I've seen this, I was a teacher for 16 years, and I saw a lot of this as well. Successful co-parenting is not, as you said, as Veronica says, not easy. But when you have a, co a parent that's not co-parenting, or it's still adversarial, I go back to the original statement of communication with your children, because you can't control what your 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 uh, the, their parent is going to do. You can only control what you're going to do, um, and you, you start having those conversations with your children in a non-adversarial way. And a lot of times, that sits with a bowl of popcorn, and you know, on the floor, talking about yourself and what you're thinking or feeling. What we don't want to do is co-parenting is we don't want to engage. Well, mom said this, uh, mom said, you're a deadbeat that mom did that mom, blah, blah. And it becomes adversarial. And you don't want to pop back with, well, your mom, this, and your mom, that it, it, it may all be true. It may not, it all may be made up. What you've got to stay is consistent in your parenting and consistent in age appropriate communication with your children, because at the end of the day, your children are going to see it and they're going to be able to determine who they can trust if the other parent is not uh, working together to where the stability is. So, you know, what is wrong is wrong. Whatever is uh, bedtime is bedtime. Those boundaries that are there and your consistent conversations starting with yourself, uh, they know that they can start building that trust into you um, to help make it last less adversarial or understanding um, where the parents are coming from. My grandmother, when my parents divorced, my grandmother would trash my mom at the drop of a hat. And that would be my dad's mom. And what my mom wanted and what she didn't do. And I would go back to my mom and my, my mom would say, well, that's not exactly true. She didn't go back and read trash my grandmother or trash my father. She just put it in perspective and say, Hey, this is her perspective, but I don't believe that's true. And, you know, and, and just reaffirmed. And then as I got older, I knew how to disseminate the, 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 the inconsistencies in the parenting strategies. And when I became a single parent, I tried to use some of those strategies when it became adversarial and not allowing myself to engage um, in some of that negativity. And, I, and I'll also mention, and I have brought it up a couple of times, the ability to work through the grieving process of this emotional trauma with your children is also paramount in handling all of these topics. They have to work through their pain. They have to work through their emotional trauma to make, to, to become um, proactive adults themselves. And you can do that simultaneously, not easy, but you can do it simultaneously, but it, it is difficult to co-parent when you have one parent that is not working together. Uh, and I'll be honest with you, if you're dealing with that parent that buys them what they want, takes them wherever they want, they don't have discipline, they don't have boundaries, I understand that makes you the bad, the bad guy or the bad person, uh, but you've got you to maintain that because at the end of the day, where does the stability lie in you know, your thoughts and your feelings? Uh, I, I mean, my son woke me up in the middle of the night wanting to talk. You know, because he, he felt he could trust me, but it started with me, it started with me and that communication of what I was thinking and feeling. Awesome. Awesome. And Bruce, I'm going to throw this one over to you and, and you know, from from this and, and, and I don't want us to lose what Veronica said, because the emotional hurts and the psychological. So talk to us, Bruce, from that legal standpoint, hurt and, and co-parenting. Yeah, I'm going to start with this uh, famous quote um, by uh, Dr. Maya Angelou when she once said that, you know, um, some some children, they will forget what you said, they may forget what you did, but they'll never forget how you made them feel. Um, and, and, that's, and that's really impactful. And I think a lot of parents, they fail to, to appreciate the residual impact of some of their selfish behaviors. Uh, a lot of these children be involved in all forms of therapy, have multiple uh, diagnoses, uh, can't focus in school, 
And a lot of this stuff is due to familiar trauma that's been unresolved. Um, so I would just encourage anyone from a legal perspective, one thing that I often advocate for before you go to getting a lot of lawyers involved is mediation. Um, mm. a, a lot of folks really don't see the true benefit of that. And there's some really plausible um, free avenues of mediation too. Matter of fact, a lot of family courts would say, hey, before you come to my courtroom with a problem, at least show that you've ex exhausted every form of remedial measure to sort of like handle this on your own through some form of mediation. Um, so I think mediation is key. Mediation is really uh, important. Um, and I think that, you know, once you get mediation in place, I think that that could really benefit uh, the family uh, wholeheartedly. Um, and lastly, I would also say, um, be mindful of any form of therapy that your child may need or may be involved with. Um, just don't think, you know, these children have to realize that it's okay not to be okay. Um, and so they're having, a, I mean, you're an adult and, you know, I, and I tell a lot of men, everyone wants to be a man, but not everyone wants to mature, you know? And again, you know, <laughs> everyone wants to be a man, but not everybody wants to mature. You know, you age chronologically, but where are you at in your maturation process? And so imagine having to deal with all these adult type traumas, but you're still trying to navigate your way through adolescence. And so mm. these children are still being deprived of their childhood, dealing with your mess. They may in fact need some form of therapy to help them process it. Um, so don't be afraid to reach out for help that your child may have. And your child may not know that they need help, but they see and they hear all. So don't be naive and selfish enough to believe, as, as you heard Michael mention, your child doesn't hear me. My child didn't see that. Maybe they were too young. Um, your child is still processing that stuff and is carrying around a lot of burdens. Uh, unfortunately, many have been self-inflicted by their parents. Mm. And, and, you know, so much of hurt, you know, I, I read a book years ago that hurt people, hurt people. Um, and and when we're in those emotional hurts, unfortunately, you know, the time we create a child, we we're we're the person you're created with was exciting. You were loving them. You were in a, a space. And then when those things break and you're hurt, the child that results becomes hurt because of our hurt. And we've been saying through all of this, even from our keynote and each and every one of you said, and, and, and it's so hard because it's. You got to handle and get the emotional pains, hurts, and things done in yourself. But how do I do that when I got little dude, little lady, and I'm dealing with the thing, or well, I won't say the thing, but the person that hurt me in my perception. And then there's these outside forces, and I got to go to these outside forces, and I want to hear you guys' thoughts about it, because one of the out outside forces that can oftentimes make this uh, a fire, be added some gasoline to it, it's called child support, okay? And in this co-parenting of relationship, child support is necessary, whether it's court order or uh, uh, out of the pocket directly to the custodial or the resident parent. Someone asked here, child support, especially interstate laws need to be updated. Yeah, everything needs to be fixed or get better. But the, the question is, how do we deal with, or how do you guys coach parents who may be adversarial because of support, whether one doesn't want to pay it or one thinks there's not enough and we, we, we got to get that financial piece taken care of so that we can, can get beyond those hurts and deals. So I want to quickly throw it over to Mike. Mike, you talk, then I'm going to throw it to Veronica and then Bruce. Go for it, Mike. Okay, so there, there are a couple, couple things. Backtrack a little bit on resources for kids grieving and the pain that they're feeling. Yes. And as both Veronica and, and, and Bruce can attest to, a lot of these single parents don't have the financial resources for therapy, psychology, a therapist. So it's real important to make sure that, especially in your state, to ferret out those resources that are available. Um, there is an organization out there called Rainbows for All Children, which is a form of peer support for the emotional trauma that's brought into the schools, the social systems, churches, places where kids um, um, can, can uh, congregate in, in a form of peer support. Um, and that's free of charge. That doesn't, uh, the, the sites pay for that. 
Well, and then when you talk about um, the uh, grieving, when you're grieving, how do you, you do it together? And, and you work together to work because if they see that you're working, working through the grief, um, the child support thing tends to add to that because two things, the system is broken. Um, uh, and, and second of all, because of the anger between the two parents with the whole child support court systems, and I understand in our head how it goes. Now they base a lot of their, the child support based on visitation. So if you're seeing your child 50% of the time, you pay less. If you're seeing your child 20% of the time, you pay more. So what happens is the court system thinks it's fair to do that. And then what happens is then you have parents arguing for 50-50 so they don't have to pay child support. We, the dad, especially dads have to understand child support is for your children, not for your, your, their mother or their, their, your ex-spouse. And even though you can argue, well, she bought a new car and, and they're taking vacations, that's my money they're using, you can't go down that road because you'll drive yourself crazy. You just have to result to the fact that there's child support that need to be paid. The, the other piece of that that makes child support system broken is I firmly believe that your children need a home base. That this 50% of time at moms and 50% of time at dads, your children are living out of backpacks. And I'm not sure that that's ultimately healthy for the children. It might be in your mind, I'm entitled to see my child 50% of the time or more. Uh, but when you're together and you're married, it's a different dynamic. Of course, you see your children every day. Of course, you see your children, uh, you know, talk to them on a regular basis. When the single parent thing kicks in, the rules change. So it's real important to go back to what we've all said. It, it's not about you. It's about your child and the relationship you have with your children. And even though the legal system says you're entitled, we've got to look at what's at the bigger picture for um you know, the, the ultimate goal of raising healthy, proactive uh, future adults. And, and I'm not 100% convinced that 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 split down the middle that I get them, you know, Sunday through Wednesday, and you get them Wednesday through uh, Sunday morning, um, it is really the best way to go to have that home plate doesn't mean you can't pick up your kids to go to dinner, you can't arrange to take turns taking them to different functions in different schools. But and I've seen it work a little bit when the, the mom and the dad lived kind of in the same neighborhood, similar schools, similar neighborhoods, similar um, uh, friends and networks because they're closer. But when you're 40 minutes away or an hour away, it's really hard for the child to do that, 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 uh, that 50, 50 split and the court systems. And I don't have the answer because I see logically where they're going with it and the entitlement, but at the same time, um, emotionally, what is that doing to their children when they don't really feel like they have one place they call home? You can have a very good relationship um, with your children by not being the custodial parent and paying a child support because it's for your children. Now, if you think that your ex is getting too much money, that then let your lawyers fight that out and how you work that out. But at the end of the day, you have to pay the support and you just, it's just like when you pay insurance, you hate writing that car insurance bill because it's so expensive, but you know, you do it. And it's the same thing with the child support. I watched my dad struggle with it. I even in the beginning used to struggle with it because I felt that she was using that money. And then finally somebody kind of hit me upside the head and said, it's not your money. It belongs to your child. So unless you have proof that your child is being neglected, you just continue to do it. So that's where my perspective is on it. Mm, all right. So, uh, Dr. Veronica, I'm coming to you with this child support and how it how it can be a hindrance, but in some points it can be a saving grace for co-parenting. So yeah, and I think one of the things. So, uh, um, just to add on to what Michael said, I think one of the key things when you're looking at child support, it's it's once you give, let's say that you are passing someone and they're homeless, and you decide to give them that money you give them that money, you don't then go, I hope they don't use it on drugs. Once you give it, you give it. I think it's the same component. Once you give the child support, you can't sit there and go, you know, I bought those new shoes, just like my, they, I'm paying for these vacations. What I will say though, I think what has been helpful, I, we have a, I have a, a client that I'm working with and the child support has been very contentious. And what we've noticed is 
keeping a good paper trail is really important because oftentimes, you know, they give a certain amount and I'm just given an arbitrary amount. Let's say it's like 300. As you all know, food, children eat a lot. They require, they require clothes, they require school and they require toys. So that money might seem like a lot, but when you really break it down and you break down what it goes to, it's really not a lot. So I think right. if you see it that way, I think it, it gives them a better insight. So I, I say paper trailing, making sure you keep everything documented. And I know we're running out of time. So I just want to say real, real quickly with that. I think that goes beyond child support though. Make sure that if you're, especially if the relationship with your, uh, the co-parenting relationship is conflictual, make sure that everything is documented, that you bring in. I, I, I like what Bruce said. I think you need to bring in at times a, a mediator someone that can really help you if you're not able to communicate but make sure everything is documented um there are some parents that just you know they go to court and they don't have the paper trail to back up what they're saying and what they're saying is accurate but there's not no proof of it no so proof. just make sure that you keep a good paper trail with child support and with everything else mm. and bruce since yeah. since uh veronica threw you to alley you go ahead and dunk yeah. it home on this one yeah I, I think you you would find as it pertains to child support, a lot of this really just depends on uh, the maturity of those who are paying the child support. I, I really do. In terms of how beneficial and how productive it's going to be long term or how contentious it's going to remain. Um, and I say that because uh, Veronica had a, a lot of key, key concepts that I was going to mention. Um, you know, you give and you give wholeheartedly because, you know, I mean, you're doing it on, on by way of blessing your child. Um, I see a lot of folks pay child support and they feel guilty and they walk away feeling bitter. Um, you know what I mean? Not as if they're looking to better their child situation. And then um, looking at it from some of my past clients who was always fathers trying to get reacclimated back in the child's life. I always tell them your most valuable commodity and asset is your time. And I say that because a lot of folks pay child support and they look at that as oh, being yeah. in lieu of spending time with that child. And then it's that at yeah. least and that at least piece. Yeah. And Perfect. I say, be yeah. careful, be careful using that term at least. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that, you hear guys say, well, at least I pay child support. But the problem when you qualify it as such, you're doing the bare minimum in regards to viewing yourself as an involved father and taking care of this child. You know what I mean? Well, you want me to pay child support? You're supposed to, that's your child. But right. you should also want to spend time with your child. Mm -hmm. And the late, great Kobe Bryant said the number one mistake that people make is believing they have so much time. And mm -hmm. so time is your most valuable asset. And that child looks at that. Most importantly, if you properly position yourself, as, as Veronica said, keeping a proper paper trail. And if you're truly invested in that child's life, you can go back to court and ask for a modification. Not mm -hmm. only with the child support, but also with visitation and perhaps, as Michael said, with custody, uh, mm -hmm. if you want to be that home base. Um, I've been paying child support all of these years. Um, my child's school is located closer to my home. Um, I believe that I'm in a proper situation. This fits my child's best interest. I'm asking for a modification due to certain change in circumstances. I've seen people, folks do that. But if you're going to walk away just by the fact that you've been ordered to pay child support, feeling angry, feeling bitter, feeling guilty, and then you take that out on your child by not spending time with your child. I mean, you're selfish and you're not going to ever get what you really want and your child's best interest would never be met that way. And you just, you can I say something real quick? Sure. Bruce just blessed us with that legal terminology. You see, <laughs> when that example of like my child school is right next to me. There was nothing related to like, and in that other home, they do this and they do that. There was no, it was just logistically pragmatic. Perfect. This is why it's the best. The court is going to be more keen. The school's right around the corner. Boom, boom, boom. It's strategically documenting the points, keeping the emotion out of it because emotion can, it, it, it will taint the arguments that you want to make and then everything goes out the window. If I could just piggyback on the, on the paper trail, I tell all my single dads and even single moms, I go buy a notebook, a spiral notebook for 99 cents at, yep. at, at Staples and you journal everything related to how you're, you're raising your children financially, emotionally, communication, things Absolutely. you buy, you keep receipts. Agreed. I have a stack of them that I never had to open. But as I tell the parents, my hope is that you kept all these and you're going to yell at me that you never had to use them. But as Veronica and Bruce have both said, 
if you don't have the paper trail to back up where you're coming from, mm -hmm. it, it's, it's, you know, it's very hard for a judge or an attorney to make a case when you can't support it. And if you keep that paper trail and you've got it, if you ever need it. And from well, an emotional stance, right? Let's say we have a child that the, the parent, whether it was a mom or their dad, sent cards and Christmas cards and yes. birthday cards, and they will return back. And then later on, your child is in their is 18, 20, you know, they're thinking of having their old children. You can say, I showed up, let me show you how. And you're yes. having a conversation when they're in an environment, in a situation where they can process it. But by the time they know that those cards are received, hurt was already done. So you're just trying to remedy some of that. Yep. Wow. Wow. And guys, I, I, I hate to stop this, but uh, look, um, if I could ask my panelists, if you get a chance before you have the we'll segment, if you can jump into the Q&A, there are a couple questions in there that some people may want. Michael, someone definitely wanted to have a, a, back, a back connection with you. Um, somebody asked about daddy issues and dealing with them themselves. Mm -hmm. But here's here's what I want to thank each and every one of you for is that you let us understand that for every single parent out here who's working to have a co-parent relationship or has the ability to have a co-parenting relationship, one, forgive yourself. Two, know it's a process. Three, it ain't easy. Four, emotions have got to be dealt with. And then number five, unfortunately, when you get into the pragmatic process, it has no emotions. Yes. Money, I agree. do I agree. this, list. It's no emotion. It becomes business. And that's so hard. And the last thing that I'll share personally, I've done personally, I've worked with over 10,000 families in the Baltimore metropolitan area throughout this country. I've run fatherhood groups. I think now we're over 100,000 guys we've worked with uh, in our group that we've, we've bet over the last 30 years. But here's what I will say, guys. The most difficult part of parenting relationships and 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 life is evaluating where you are and finding out where your opportunity to grow is yes that's a hard when i tell guys all the time you know when they come to my group and they start man that she ain't this she ain't that she ain't this i was like slow down bro because she was everything when you created the kid so stop right. the foolishness and find out where you are in the process and i'm that guy i'm not doctor i'm not the lawyer and i don't run single dads i'm the dude who will tell you in your face man the man woman the woman hey you bring a lot of problems to this too solve you they'll solve them thank you guys Amen. for being here i appreciate each and every one of you if you can jump into the the q a if you don't if you have a few minutes if you can respond back to just a couple of the questions that are there, we really love for the participants to have you. So thank you guys. And let's give them a, a, a virtual round of applause. We appreciate them all for being here, guys.